Well, Matt Bottomley is here. He's a research analyst with Canaccord Genuity. Matt, welcome back. Good to see you again. You too. Matt, it's 2019. Different crop of uh, cannabis stories out there, though some are the same. What is the main thrust of your interest in 2019 in the cannabis space? Well, a lot of the, uh, the companies that came to market in Q3, Q4 of 2018 that are U.S. operators, I think are going to have a ton of news flow, a ton of uh, new licenses that are going to be issued in the U.S. Uh, Execution is going to be a big story. So obviously the canopies of the world and those companies have a ton of, on their plate as well, and they still are the largest companies, uh, cannabis companies in the world. I expect them to continue to execute internationally as well as giving more color on what they're actually selling uh, into the Canadian and recreational markets, but there's another 20 or 30 sub-markets within the U.S. that's very, very difficult uh, to, to follow, and it's kind of what, what takes up a lot of my time now. And uh, there's probably five, six, or seven companies that have come to market on the U.S. side that are all clamoring for positions in markets like Florida and New York and mm -hmm. Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, and I think those are the stories that are, that are going to get a lot of traction this year. I think the relative valuations of many of these uh, U.S. cannabis operators that are listed in Canada uh, are a lot more compelling. And I think you're going to see a lot of very impressive revenue and EBITDA run rates sooner with these U.S. names compared to the Canadian licensed producers. Hmm. Interesting. Some of the larger uh, U.S. MSOs came to market with the valuation that you might think they would have to backfill with actual, you know, real estate and sales and dispensaries and key markets. Do you think that some of them are going to find that challenging or do you think that for the most part the US MSOs are well positioned to fan out across the available marketplace yeah. and dominate? Well, I think all cannabis companies, regardless of, uh, uh, of the markets that they're going after, there is that element of backfilling where uh, execution is going to be a very, very, very significant element in order to justify any valuation in the billion dollar plus club. And there's many companies that fit that bill now. But if you add up the aggregate market capitalization of all the US players right now, it's probably in Canadian dollars somewhere in the realm of 15 billion or lower. Mm -hmm. On the Canadian side, and uh, admittedly there is international optionality to, to, to huge uh, medical markets where we still need more clarity on. But the Canadian licensed producers have an aggregate market cap of 75 billion. So if you look at just the domestic opportunity in Canada versus the domestic opportunity in the U.S., it's much, much more attractive south of the border. We're having some of the hemp uh, businesses uh, start to open up now with the passing of the Farm Bill, and, and the Canadians aren't precluded from that. Uh, but really, you have seven, eight, or nine, or whatever the number is, of large-scale multi-state operators that right now could re-rate from that 15 billion in aggregate uh, potentially is higher, higher than where the Canadian names are now. So I think execution, as I said, is going to be critical, but I also think there might be a natural valuation re-rating right. as U.S. companies might be the first ones to say, hey, we're at $500 million revenue run rates or whatever the number is uh, well before the canopies of the world. So I, sure. I think a re-rating is, 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 is much more likely hmm. uh, in 2019 uh, for the U.S. players. Wow. So I think it's safe to say that from the, on the, in the case of the Canadian incumbent large caps, uh, this is the year that they're rated on the balance sheet, more so than the speculative value that has characterized their valuation increase to date. Sure. I mean, the, the intangible value of all the markets they're going to get into is very, very important. I mean, we have uh, licensed producers right now with valuations of, you know, 15 billion plus. So right. uh, we, d we now see Constellation with 5 billion plus on the, or sorry, Canopy rather, with 5 billion plus on the balance sheet. Uh, Altria made an investment in Kronos. So they're very, very strong balance sheets right now. I expect there to be more strategic players coming into the space, but you're absolutely, absolutely right. In order for the aggregate market capitalization I mentioned of, let's say it's 75 billion in Canada, uh, to be justified and then I'll ha and also have further upside, you're going to have to see a ton of execution in Canada. You're going to have to see pricing maintained and you eventually in the next two or three years are going to have to see meaningful contribution come from international markets, else the valuations just aren't justifiable. You bet. So this is one of the areas where I hear from a lot of people that suggest that the, the real discount is in the U.S. MSOs listed in Canada. And then on the other hand, the Canadian uh, well, that they're not multi-state operators, they're multi-country operators, mm -hmm. which is an opportunity that's generally the U.S. MSOs are excluded from because of the federal prohibition restrictions. Do you think that these, like for example, Canopy, Aurora, Afria, uh, CanTrust, to a lesser degree, some other ones, are very sort of well positioned now in terms of the global opportunity and is, is 2019 going to see a a situation where those international opportunities do start to become major contributors to the balance sheet in your opinion? 
Uh, yes, I don't think it's about 2019. I think it's about 2019 to 2029 in terms of this entire uh, global uh, opportunity starting to roll out. Some countries will be sooner rather than later. Uh, Germany, although it's been delayed for some time now, will probably be the, one of the first major countries out of Europe to start having meanif meaningful contributions and domestic cultivation awards uh, and production awards um, given. But I, I think you have to look at the international market as, you know, you have Canadian medical that's sort of, you know, this big, then you have rec and then the global and, and it's all going to take, uh, you know, much, much more time, the bigger the opportunity is. So 2019 is going to be much more important than 2018 when it comes to execution, because now we're going to see real revenues, we're going to see profitability. It's a bit of the show me story. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of there being, you know, I, I say Canopy as an example, just because they're the largest, in terms of Canopy having a, a revenue line that's 50% Canada and 50% international, I think it's going to take several years for, for that to happen. Sure. Uh, we had Namaste as a guest here earlier, Sean Dollinger was here, and he's sort of made this case that they're in a you know, sort of separate track in that they're they're pursuing this uh, technology uh, online marketplace sort of angle mm -hmm. of the whole cannabis thing. Do you think some of those other business models are going to be able to sort of keep up with the mega valuations that are being uh, allocated to the multi-state and multi-country operators? Well, maybe. It's a case-by-case -case basis, but at the end of the day, particularly with the uh, the, can the companies that are selling cannabis product directly, um, that translates at some level to an EBITDA, that translates to a cash flow, and that is what's going to support the valuations. There isn't going to be uh, a lot of subjectivity or ambiguity once the market starts to mature, or at least not as much, because at the end of the day, you know, this sector is going to trade something like a consumer branded uh, market once it once it uh, transitions to that, and that's a 12 times, maybe there's a premium because there's higher barriers to entry, so maybe a 15 times multiple ultimately at maturity. So it's going to be the fundamental underlying EBITDA and cash flow that support that. If there's another company like Namaste or others that are doing, you know, parallel plays, whether it's technology, whether it's delivery, whether it's, you know, data analytics, whatever it is, you know, I think it's to the same regard. All boats are going to float to a degree, and then it's going to be those who execute and then those that can actually show it in their quarter over quarter results. Sure. And finally, the uh, proliferation of companies focused on the biopharma or pharmaceutical opportunity, whereas, you know, in the context of GW Pharma, who is focusing on extracting certain molecules, concentrating them, and applying them towards specific mm -hmm. uh, remedies for the human illnesses and creating value through that sort of pharmaceutical. Of, mm -hmm. of cannabis. How much of an opportunity is that relative to the recreational and otherwise medicinal? Well, I mean, it's it's the golden goose to a degree. It's a significant opportunity uh, if you can get uh, you know FDA approved backing and you can get IP and, and and exclusivity on certain things. It's very hard with the plant, right? The plant itself you can't patent. Mm -hmm. uh, my opinion is everyone is likely working on this very diligently. But I think much like we saw Constellation and, and from Big Alcohol and Altria from Big Tobacco come in the space, I think it's going to be the strategic investors in the pharmaceutical company that bring that over the over the goal line. So at some point, and I think they might. Might even be the last to the party when it comes to investing. Right. At some point in the next year or two, whatever it is, I believe you'll see big pharma come into this space, and I believe their infrastructure, their uh, global reach, their uh, you know decades and decades of experience doing clinical trials is likely what's going to bring that over. So it's a huge market opportunity, right. but it's also the most speculative in a speculative industry. Sure, Novartis put a big chunk of money into Tilray. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the biggest of the uh, so? You kind of got to exclude uh, Canopy from that potentiality because they've already got their big dance partner yeah. in Constellation. But Aurora, in particular, has yet to sort of demonstrate a solidifying partnership across a mega cap player mm -hmm. in any of food and beverage, biopharma, or, or consumer packaged goods. Do you think that that makes Aurora a prime target for some of these mega cap companies? Well, I think Aurora is by far the, the next target on the list. If I had to handicap who's next, when you think of the big players in the space, there's kind of five, right? You have Canopy that has a partner. You have uh, Tilray that kind of has a partner. There could be still others they bring in. Some of them are in joint venture form. Uh, then you have uh, Kronos that got a dance partner. Afria that right now obviously is, is going through what it's going through. Uh, with leaving Aurora, I think with Aurora, there's a lot that they've done. I mean, they had an acquisition this week as well of Whistler. Uh, 
medical cannabis, uh, you know, there's a lot of acquisitions that that company's done. There's a lot of integration of seven or eight deals. So mm -hmm. that might complicate it when it comes to a strategic coming into the market. But if I had to guess who the next likely candidate would be or who the most attractive candidate is that does not have yet a global uh, strategic partner, my, my bet would be on Aurora. You bet. All right, Matt, we're going to leave it there for now and come back to you soon again. Your insight as usual is much appreciated. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you.